Evening. I, I suspect a few people have got a bit lost in the labyrinth uh, that is SOAS, so uh, I hope we won't be too disrupted by people coming in a little bit late. Uh, my name's Phil Clark, um, and I teach comparative and international politics uh, here at SOAS, uh, and it's, it's great to see you come out uh, this evening to talk about these issues around uh, peace and reconciliation in Uganda. Uh, there's clearly a, a, a crucial focus on Uganda at the moment, uh, given the, the recent elections, uh, debates around uh, the International Criminal Court, perennial debates around the ICC, I would say, uh, particularly with the start of the Dominic Ongwen trial. And I think as we're going to hear this evening, uh, continuing repercussions following uh, the Juba peace talks between the Ugandan government and the Lord's Resistance Army between 2006 and 2008. Eight years have passed since those talks. Those talks are sometimes described as failed talks because uh, the final part of the agreement was not signed. But I think as we're going to discuss this evening, uh, those talks continue to reverberate in Uganda in very important ways and continue to structure ongoing discussions around uh, peace and reconciliation. Now, immediately you will have noticed that our panel is quite different uh, from how it was advertised. And I must apologize for that because we had very, very late withdrawals uh, from both uh, Barney Afako um, and uh, Betty Bigombe. I guess this is one of the occupational hazards of a project that focuses on leaders uh, because we're talking about uh, very dynamic people who are greatly in demand. Barney had to race off to the Yemen peace talks that are currently taking place in Kuwait. So he sends his apologies for that. Uh, and Betty has some very, very late uh, urgent business with the World Bank. Um, right up until this morning, I was still crossing my fingers that she would be able to get on a flight from DC. That unfortunately wasn't possible. We've also tried to secure her by Skype this evening. That hasn't been possible either. So I, I do apologize for that. Uh, but the virtue uh, in all of that is that we get a lot more dedicated time this evening to, to engage uh, directly with Michael Ottim, uh, who has a huge amount of experience dealing with, with peace and reconciliation issues, particularly in northern Uganda, and I'll give Michael a, a full welcome in, in just a moment. I should also mention, and I said this in the email, that tonight's event uh, is being uh, filmed and there will be a YouTube uh, video of this posted in the next week or so. So please bear that in mind uh, when it comes to the, the Q&A uh, session. If you're going to say anything incendiary, uh, that's fine, but it will be broadcast uh, globally in the next few days. So um, a, a slight sort of warning about that. Very briefly, just let me say something about uh, the wider project that tonight's event uh, fits into. The, the project um, that, that I'm coordinating at the moment is called Learning from Leaders, uh, Understanding Elite Experiences of Peace, Reconciliation and Forgiveness After Civil Conflict. And it's funded by an organization called the Fetzer Institute. What this project is particularly interested in is the role of what the project is calling go-between or middle tier leaders uh, in peace and reconciliation efforts. There's a lot of literature uh, that discusses the role of national elites and a vast literature that talks about the importance of community level actors uh, in peace and reconciliation processes. But what this project tries to do is to look at a, a separate category of actors who in many ways bridge these two levels, who, who move backwards and forwards between the national and, and the community level. That often involves carrying uh, the needs and concerns of local communities to elites at the national level and having to communicate back to the community what's been taking place um, in, in national peace negotiations uh, in particular. Um, and in fact, Joseph Nye has a, a phrase that we've been using in this project. He, he calls it leading from the middle, uh, which I think is, is very applicable to uh, the particular leaders that this uh, project is, is focusing on. And what the project is really interested in is what are the, the very specific challenges that these go-between or middle-tier leaders face uh, in trying to negotiate uh, the different uh, difficulties of, of, of these two uh, levels of processes uh, and, and actors. This requires very particular types of leadership, um, and I think it requires very particular types of, of leaders. The project looks at four case studies. Uh, it's looked at Colombia, Sri Lanka, Uganda, of course, and Northern Ireland. And as part of the project, uh, I've been hosting uh, these public dialogues. Uh, we've already done the events for Colombia and Sri Lanka, bringing middle tier go-between leaders uh, from across different uh, sectors of, of those two uh, societies. And uh, it's a real honor to, to have Michael Ottim with us here this evening to, to add uh, Uganda to, to that list. 
Let me say something about the format uh, for tonight. It, it's, it's pretty straightforward uh, because uh, we, we have a single speaker this evening. Um, Michael's going to, uh, I guess, present for about 15 minutes, uh, talking especially about his personal role in uh, various peace and reconciliation efforts uh, in Uganda. Uh, he's then going to engage in about a 20 minute uh, dialogue with me, um, bouncing off of the presentation that he'll give. And then that will give us ample time, anywhere between sort of 45 minutes and an hour, um, to engage with you as the audience, questions and comments that, that, that you might uh, have. So let me introduce uh, Michael properly. He's the outgoing head of the International Centre for Transitional Justice Office uh, based in Kampala. He was previously the director of the Gulu NGO Forum, uh, in which role he coordinated Northern Ugandan civil society throughout uh, the LRA conflict. Uh, he's the co-founder of the Justice and Reconciliation Project in Northern Uganda, one of the really seminal NGOs working on, on various transitional justice issues. For our purposes tonight, I think a key element of Michael's background is that he led the Northern Ugandan civil society delegation to the Juba peace talks between the Ugandan government and the LRA throughout the period of the negotiations between 2006 and 2008. And in that particular role, uh, he was one of the last uh, negotiators to engage directly with, with Joseph Kony uh, in Garumba National Park uh, in November 2008, in fact, after the Juba peace process uh, had formally finished. So Michael brings uh, a really extensive uh, experience um, in a personal and professional capacity at national and community levels uh, really over the last 15 to 20 years. And I think tonight in particular is going to focus largely on his experiences uh, during the, the Juba uh, peace talks and the kind of repercussions that he thinks those negotiations are still having in, in Uganda today. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Michael. It's a, it's a real honour uh, for us here at SOAS uh, to have you uh, this evening and we look forward to, to hearing your views. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks, Phil, and for that very elaborate introduction. And uh, to all of you for coming, and in particular, inviting me to SOAS uh, to share some of our experiences uh, in engaging with the uh, peace process in Uganda, and of course, also looking at the issues of international justice and the complicating factors. Those of you who are familiar with the situation in northern Uganda, know that that's a region that experienced over two decades of violence. And uh, of course, with the resultant consequences of uh, gross human rights violations, abductions of young children, killings. And uh, because of the dire situation, a number of attempts were being made to try and reach a peaceful solution. Betty, who should have been with us here, uh, made the first shot uh, around 1994 uh, to reach out uh, to uh, the LRA to try and see uh, how a peaceful resolution to the conflict could be achieved. Unfortunately, those events uh, didn't pay off. The talks collapsed and uh, the violence resumed with catastrophic consequences that led to the creation of IDP camps, if you recall, we had close to over 1.8 million people displaced uh, as a result of the ongoing fighting between the government of Uganda forces and the rebels of the LRA. At the time, there were few international actors responding uh, to the humanitarian needs. And so our focus at the time was to try and see how we could deal with the consequences of um, uh, the humanitarian catastrophe as well as find solutions uh, for peace. We teamed up with a number of civil society actors locally, cultural, le religious leaders, uh, with the support of a few international partners, who I see some of them here, to try and find a solution, an immediate one. And in 2000, one of the things that came up was the need to put in place an amnesty act, which was essentially to extend an olive branch uh, to the rebels. Uh, to abandon a rebellion and return home. 
Uh, of course, government reluctantly accepted that, but eventually uh, they said, well, if this is what the people want, let's give it. If it can help uh, uh, you know, reduce the impact of the conflict. And as a result, a number of actors or rebels uh, you know, actually benefited from the amnesty. Now, you will also note that at the time, of course, uh, 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 there had to be a, a lot of advocacy work to be done. So one of the things that we tried to do was to form civil society coalitions, both at the local level and the national level. Uh, for instance, one of them was SOPNU, that is a civil society organization for peace in uh, northern Uganda, to try and um, do advocacy on the need for a peaceful solution. Uh, of course, we noted that there were a number of challenges at the time, uh, in part because the government at the time was suspicious of the people from the north. Uh, in particular, if you advocated for peaceful solution, that was almost an either or. Either you are for the rebels or you are for the state. There was that kind of divide. And so actors who would, for instance, advocate for peace were labeled either opposition groups or rebel collaborators and so on. And uh, it was a difficult space to navigate. Also at the national level, even among policymakers itself, there was very little knowledge about what was really going on. The intensity of the conflict was not known. Uh, also international actors who are even based in Kampala were less reluctant to discuss the issue of peace. Uh, most of them preferred to deal uh, with what we would almost call soft issues. We'll provide humanitarian assistance, but we don't want uh, to engage in the complicated discussion of for peace. And um, of course, even in the country itself, uh, given the historical differences, north-south divide, you'll find that even other parts of the country, say south of Karuma, it knew very little of even what was happening in the north, for instance. And there was that uh, kind of reluctance. So it was a kind of complicated terrain. Uh, nonetheless, one of the things that we also did in early 2001 was to try to organize an international advocacy mission for civil society leaders uh, to different capitals, uh, to London, to Washington, to Brussels, Ottawa, and a few places, including the UN, to kind of uh, explain what was happening in the North and calling for international action. Following that international mission, we had visits of a number of high-ranking uh, officials, both from the UN, uh, foreign governments, uh, from the Dutch government, foreign minister, Sweden, and of course, um, uh, Jan Igland, who was the then UN coordinator for humanitarian affairs visiting. And uh, he described um, the situation as one of the most forgotten conflicts. And that, in a way, kind of raised international attention about the issues, but of course, largely focus was still on humanitarian. Uh, but uh, later on, of course, with continued advocacy by other international actors who partnered with local civil society groups like, you know, conciliation resources and other partners, I think the level of awareness continued to be raised. Um, but above all, I think uh, in 2003, when Uganda became the first country to refer the situation of the LRA to the ICC, I think it drew in a lot of international attention to the situation. Uh, a number of international justice actors and different groups began you know, engaging and looking at the situation in northern Uganda. Uh, but at the same time, while the ICC intervention uh, came in, it raised a number of complicating factors, especially addressing the question of peace and justice and the possible uh, complications or difficulties of pursuing justice during ongoing conflict uh, became quite evident. And of course, as you will note, uh, the Uganda peace efforts or peace negotiations were happening for the first time under the scrutiny of an international uh, uh, you know, court. And uh, so it kind of 
pose some challenges and dynamics on how to proceed. Nonetheless, of course, even for the people on the ground, there was very limited knowledge about the court. Not many people had heard about the court. Initially, there was uh, what you call an overwhelming um, uh, kind of interest when the court was intervening. But the more people got to know about the court that didn't have a police force and so on, you know, then uh, they realized that things might become more complicated than what they were before, and hence some kind of hesitation. And uh, of course, uh, at that time, uh, you find that is when, of course, different arguments started coming. Well, it looks like the ICC is going to make peace very difficult. It also looks like other actors were thinking that probably the ICC was coming to trample on local initiatives and stop any effort. So there are all those di divergent views. Uh, but of course, another big challenge that posed, we faced was the divergent views, even both uh, at the national and the local level, of how this conflict could be ended. These divergent views, because where the conflict was playing out at the community level, people had different views and suggestions of how. They wanted a peaceful solution, while others were you know, proposing other interventions. But it is not surprising uh, uh, why the community you know, felt that they had preferred peace at that time over any efforts because of the continued suffering. But also, above all, you will note that most of the fighters within the LI ranks were from the epicenter of where the conflict was playing on. Predominant at that time, the actually subregion before the conflict spread off to other areas. And uh, they know the circumstances of how these children uh, went to the bush, that most of them were actually abducted. And uh, so this really influenced views, because most people would strongly feel that, well, these are our children. Uh, we should welcome them back home. And uh, they will find their own way of how to deal with the crimes that their children will have meted on them. Um, of course, the government kind of continued pursuing a two-pronged approach, a combination of amnesty and uh, a military solution. Uh, and of course, these were kind of contradictory at the same time. Uh, which also posed uh, serious challenges. But of course, following the events also of September tw uh, you know, 2011 in the US, uh, it also changed the dynamics. And for the first time, the LR was listed as a terrorist organization. And uh, also that complicated things because, I mean, naturally it would mean you cannot negotiate with terrorists anymore, or the US will definitely not support any attempts uh, to discuss with a group that has been labeled in that category. And uh, subsequent uh, you know, enactment of the LRA disarmament and Northern Uganda Recovery Act uh, to try, which also kind of provided, uh, while providing humanitarian assistance, it also advocated for other ways of uh, supporting efforts that can lead to the capture and surrender of uh, the indicted LRA commanders to the ICC. Um, during that time, we also supported local efforts uh, of cultural, religious leaders, especially in also pursuing uh, local initiatives, uh, local uh, practices, traditional uh, mechanisms of how former fighters who had abandoned rebellion and received amnesty could be reintegrated into the communities so there are simple welcome ceremonies uh, that would be conducted and other reconciliation dialogues and meetings to try and integrate uh, some of these um, uh, communities, um, uh, I mean, some of these returnees uh, in the communities. And almost, you find the, there was almost a dichotomy in kind of perceptions because different actors were playing, I mean, intervening in the situation and uh, there was that kind of polarized debate where some people would almost also perceive the ICC arrest warrants as being almost synonymous with supporting a continued military campaign. 
And so all this uh, divide was also playing out in the region. Um, as I said, many had not known about the court and how it works, but uh, some felt uh, that um, also given the nature of how the ICC referrals uh, came into play, uh, uh, the ICC was acting impartially. It was inve investigating only one side of the conflict and not the other. And this, of course, um, continues to be a challenge uh, to date. Uh, of course, given those dynamics, uh, at that time, not many people had anticipated that more protracted negotiations were ever going to happen with the rebels. And um, in early 2006, uh, through uh, interlocutors, uh, we got some information that the LRA was willing uh, to negotiate uh, with the government to end uh, the conflict. And we, as civil society leaders, teamed up with uh, some of the uh, 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 South Sudanese leaders who had already made contact with the rebels to try and, um, uh, you know, engage and offer ideas of how best that can be uh, uh, done. Uh, because the fear the South Sudanese government at the time had was whether the government of Uganda would ever be willing uh, to discuss. But fortunately, uh, that happened, and uh, the government, in principle, accepted to negotiate uh, with the LRA. Uh, definitely, the talks were not very easy uh, in the first place. That was initially, as I said, uh, first some level of reluctance. But when the government started engaging in the process, they basically viewed uh, the negotiations as one that should entirely be about giving the LRA a soft landing, given their past historical records, and not really any protracted negotiation uh, that could be ever made. But looks like the LRA also had actually prepared uh, to really, uh, you know, put, uh, give in their position of what they think are the issues around the conflict and what needs to be done. And uh, finally, the government accepted, and negotiations happened. As I said, the negotiations were also, uh, you know, faced with serious challenges right from the beginning, from the time the cessation of hostilities were being discussed. Uh, you find the LRA would regularly breach the terms. Uh, there are instances when they would disrespect the request to assemble in particular places, or even there were instances when they, their delegations actually walked out of the negotiations. And uh, this raised serious concern and uh, of course as liaison and engaging in the process we had to do a lot of shuttle diplomacy uh, to the bush uh, to meet with the LRA leadership in remote places to try and see how we can contribute uh, towards uh, resolving some of those misunderstandings. Um, of course the negotiations that as I said earlier on were happening at a time when the ICC was in place and of course uh, there are all questions that people ask to what extent uh, the ICC uh, in itself was a hindrance uh, to the discussions. Uh, definitely as you will see uh, the talk somehow proceeded even under the watchful eye of the ICC. Uh, there's no doubt that international ju justice uh, posed uh, you know a risk uh, 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 but the extent to which we can say the talks actually collapsed because of the ICC is something that really needs to be discussed. But I know there were other more complicating factors surrounding the talks, and it was very difficult to say uh, one. But at the same time, we also note that the presence of the ICC itself exerted a level of pressure on the discussions, especially on agenda item number three. And uh, of course, uh, on the other hand, uh, we note that uh, we had to tell the LR leadership that there is no way you are going to avoid this agenda item uh, because this agreement is not going to be accepted locally because civil society groups had already given their views of what they want about justice and accountability as well as the international community would never accept an agreement that excludes uh, an element 
of uh, dealing with the whole question of accountability and reconciliation. Um, in order to negotiate those agendas, we definitely had to take an approach where we felt that uh, we had to give, uh, you know, bring the actors to a common level of understanding. Because from what we see from a number of peace processes, it's not always those who are the negotiators who know the in-depth subject matter of particular issues. And because when you know there was a high level of mistrust during the talks, uh, you know there was finger pointing. It's you who did this. It's you who did that. It's you who did that. And so the approach we had to take was one where we said, okay, when we approach this agenda item, we'll get do a seminar, get everybody on board. Um, and I remember we titled it "Common Understanding for Local." national and international justice initiatives, something like that. <coughs> and that, okay, let's all start from a clean slate. Let's come and understand these things and negotiate. Whoever did what is not something we can fully conclude in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the meeting room. These, uh, we leave the things, uh, those issues to the mechanisms that will be put in place in the future to find out who did what. But if we go finger pointing, then we are not going to be able to actually reach any, you know, and it will just drag on forever. And there was actually a strong fear that actually if we got to that agenda item, probably that would have broken the talks. But somehow it, we navigated through quite quickly to the surprise of very many people. Um, well, fast forward, as you all know, the talks, five agenda items were reached from uh, the cessation of hostilities to the comprehensive solutions to accountability and reconciliation uh, to the whole framework for implementation and DDR arrangements. Uh, these individual agreements were signed. Uh, however, on the date of signing the final peace agreement, Joseph Cohn did not show up, citing a number of concerns. Uh, of course, when Cohn realized that his interest in having the whole ICC question uh, removed from the talks not being addressed, he started backing off and uh, not engaging in the process in any meaningful manner. And uh, that was it. Any attempts to try and get them, we made a number of visits under very risky circumstances sometimes, uh, but uh, we were not able to influence. And of course, we had also to liaise a lot, do shuttle work with uh, the mediators and the government of Uganda to give some time uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, we are able to uh, get a compromise solution. Unfortunately, as you all know, from 2008, 2009, actually 2008, December, Operation Lightning Thunder started with the support of the U.S. military and the LRA dispersed further to Central Africa. And uh, the rest, as you know, is still ongoing. Uh, but of course, uh, one thing we can ask ourselves and still ask ourselves is whether the ICC was really completely a stumbling block. I think not so completely because in still, despite the arrest warrants, the negotiations still continue to happen and uh, were concluded. But as I said, it did pose a risk and a challenge for the process, and that pressure was carefully you know, uh, 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 utilized in crafting an agreement that still would address the whole question of international justice, but also above all, allowed Uganda to begin thinking more seriously about putting in place domestic mechanisms uh, to deal with the whole question of accountability and reconciliation locally. Now, since the conclusion of the talks, even if the final peace agreement was not signed, at least there was a consensus uh, by the mediation that those individual agreements uh, were just not provisional instruments, but valid agreements that should be signed and, I mean, implemented. And the government of Uganda committed itself uh, to fully implement um, 
uh, uh, those agreements. Uh, they tried to, you know, do a few things. They continue to roll out recovery and development programs in the affected areas. They also set up a framework within the government under the justice and law order sector to develop a framework for implementing transitional justice in Uganda. And they also set up a war crimes court, the International Crimes Division, um, which of course started its first case which, and was fraught with challenges. Uh, the trial is due to resume hopefully in July this year. Uh, they have also developed a transitional justice policy framework. It's yet due to be approved by cabinet. They are also working on a reparations policy. But of course one thing that is uh, quite disturbing is that despite these developments, little has been achieved. Uh, it's eight years down the road and uh, it almost signifies a lack of political will uh, to kind of commit to full implementation of those agreements in our view and has become an issue of concern. Uh, but nonetheless, we continue to support the efforts of civil society actors to support in the absence of official responses. What can civil society do uh, to, you know, uh, 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 bridge that gap? Because the consequences of the violations and uh, the need for reconciliation at the community are still issues that are of major concern. Uh, issues around, um, uh, you know, uh, reparations, uh, issues around people who suffered uh, sexual and gender-based violence, and so on and so forth, uh, still uh, continue to be issues of concern that need to be addressed. And so uh, uh, there are still a number of issues as we still talk. As uh, Phil noted earlier on, uh, of course, uh, as the country moves on, um, the question of northern Uganda seems to be disappearing under the radar, in a way, in the sense that uh, government is now more preoccupied with the political issues uh, following the recent elections, um, which uh, of course, and uh, of course, they are all issues around human rights violations, the treatment of opposition groups uh, with high handedness by members of the security forces. Uh, the lack of level playing ground uh, in the last election and the Commonwealth Observer Group and the EU mission, I think, uh, to a large extent thought that the elections that were held uh, 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 this year in February fell short of in minimum standards. Uh, surprisingly, uh, the AU countries felt that the elections were free and fair. So you find those divergent <laughs> views. Uh, of course, uh, one of the opposition candidates, the former prime minister, went to court uh, 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 seeking to overturn the elections, but uh, the court unanimously upheld uh, that, uh, well, even if there were irregularities, uh, the results were not substantial enough to warrant uh, the annulment of that election, uh, although they criticized the electoral commission for, you know, uh, 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 mismanaging the process and, uh, of course, being biased. So, civic space also in the country continues to be an issue of concern. Uh, we have uh, some NGO laws, especially uh, uh, restricting action of civil society groups, which has been also criticized, and of course the use of other pieces of legislation. A number of people think, uh, 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 you know, uh, violate civil liberties like the Public Order Management Act and so on, which continue to restrict civil liberties and ability of different groups to organize. So I would say in brief, this is just uh, a small picture of what the situation is currently, and uh, I look forward to having uh, more discussions with you at some point. So thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, th th there's plenty there, I, I think, to get us thinking, get, get us talking. Um, I, I guess what I want to do is, is sort of begin a, a conversation here by picking up on some of the themes that you mentioned in your presentation and maybe just to develop them a, a little bit more. Um, and, and then we'll throw it open to the audience for, uh, for comments and, and questions. I mean, I, 
I guess I want to come back to this, um, this kind of theme of the project as a whole, th this idea of go between leaders who, who are trying to, to bridge uh, national and, and community levels. And of course, one, one of the criticisms of the, the Juba peace talks was that they were at such a distance from the most affected communities in northern Uganda and, and that many uh, local people felt that their voices weren't being uh, heard and recognized in, in the negotiations. As, yeah. as a civil society leader uh, from northern Uganda who spent so much time in Juba, um, can you say something about the, the challenges that you faced in, in getting local voices heard um, and, and some of the processes you engaged in to, to try and overcome that problem? And you can stay here if you like, Michael, brother. It's, it's entirely up to you. OK. You have a microphone? Can you, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. yeah. So we don't, OK. All right. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, of course, uh, given the fact that the negotiation were taking place far removed from the conflict-affected area, also raised a number of issues. I mean, it was natural that the talks would not easily be held in Uganda given the circumstances and the antagonistic relationship between the rebels and the government of Uganda and so the talks had to be held somewhere somehow and um, one of the things is that uh, definitely people were interested in getting their voices different actors group civil society women's groups and so on and uh, so what we had to do was uh, to engage with the mediation uh, to try and make sure open space for different groups, especially women's groups, uh, to engage in the process. I remember they organized the peace caravan, which traveled all the way from northern Uganda across the region to Juba uh, to, you know, take a message of what they want to see out of the process. Uh, but also locally, what we did was to organize uh, 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 dialogues and uh, you know town hall meetings, community meetings, to get people's views on different aspects of uh, what was going to be uh, discussed, but above all, also creating a fora through which what was happening in Juba could be relayed uh, to the people, but of course in a more responsible way, given the sensitivity of some of the other issues that were being discussed, but nonetheless keep them informed of what was happening. And uh, this, in a way, helped uh, uh, people kind of follow up and, of course, have a high interest uh, in the negotiations. And I can say uh, the different uh, you know, uh, voices were effectively, to a large extent, communicated uh, uh, in Juba. I remember uh, one of our colleagues remarked at the end is that uh, the agreements, actually, the people who won were the people of northern Uganda because, to a large extent, their views were reflected. And it's probable the LRA forgot to negotiate about themselves. So in other words, uh, it's the people, <laughs> you know, so they, largely their views were reflected uh, in those, um, in those uh, 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 um, uh, 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 agreements. Uh, naturally, of course, you can't get everybody to Juba. Of course, practically, it's just impossible. But then we had to devise mechanisms through which information would flow. But also, in some instances, there were situations where victims' groups would also come over and, uh, you know, participate, watch, see what is happening, have their take on it as well. Yeah. Michael was, was subjected to a, a good two and a half hour grilling uh, for the research project this morning, um, which gave me some fairly interesting information that I now want to turn against him um, in a couple of these questions. But, um, but what, what one thing that you, you said this morning that I, I thought was particularly interesting in terms of your role in Juba and the role of the civil society delegation specifically, you, you focused on two things that I thought were particularly interesting. One was, you, you talked about the importance of fostering even good social relations mm. between the government and the LRA. And, and I think you hosted one of the first dinners between the delegations at a very frosty time. Mm. I thought that was interesting that the social element of peace negotiations, that it's not just sitting around the table trying to negotiate very difficult um, political and legal issues, but it's also about the personal interactions between the actors. So I thought that that was the first thing. And the second thing, and you mentioned it in your presentation here, was the role in actually educating the parties at the talks about some of the technical issues <clears throat> that they were facing in the negotiations, that 
the negotiators themselves and, and, and the parties weren't always on top of the key issues and that you had to hold this transitional justice seminar with the government and the LRA at the height of the talks. And I thought these were two very interesting roles um, that your delegation played in the middle of, of the talks. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more uh, about the need to foster positive social relations and also to educate parties, because I think perhaps that's something we don't think about in terms of peace negotiations a lot. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, uh, Phil. Um, we just have two hours to discuss something that has happened in so many years. But nonetheless, I'll make an attempt. Uh, Yes, as you know, conflicts kind of create very antagonistic relations. Uh, there is normally bitterness, uh, accusations and counter accusations by different parties on the different groups. And uh, for you to have some meaningful dialogue, you need to create space uh, 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 to kind of allow the parties cool off and listen to each other in one way or another. Um, and of course, uh, 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 be able to dialogue in a meaningful way. Uh, 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 because uh, if you take that very confrontational approach, then chances are that actually reaching a final deal may become very hard. And sometimes it takes just a few people who have the meeting of the minds to begin and initiate that process. And in the case of the LRA, uh, what we did because when we realized that at one point, you know, we just felt the talks seemed just to go and collapse. So we approached the mediation and said, look, let's create a forum through which we can get these two parties together. And so they organized this dinner and both groups came. And uh, in a way, you could see tension because they would not even greet each other to begin with. Uh, they would not talk to each other at all. And so the following day, you could see people shaking hands, even if they are from different camps. You know, speak, at least it broke the ice in a way and eased some tension that, well, not everybody is as you know, bad as we probably thought. And in a way, it eased the uh, tension. And um, secondly, on the whole question around educating the parties, as I did say, I mentioned earlier on, it's not always that the people who are involved in the direct negotiations are actually knowledgeable on all the issues that are actually being uh, discussed. And they will need a bit of input and support on some of those matters of how they can you know, uh, discuss them. Because some of them approach them from a very unrealistic point of view. And I can say this seminar uh, was really very, very important. And subsequently, other seminars were also held, especially that eased uh, the tension. For instance, on DDR was also uh, very helpful in easing uh, the tension because we got experts who came and facilitated seminars on most of all those agenda items subsequently. Of course, the most challenging one was the cessation of hostilities and uh, the whole question around, uh, 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 you know, how because there are security matters and uh, mostly were being handled by military people. Uh, I'm not a person with a military background, but nonetheless, uh, I thought that uh, uh, some of these interventions are actually very important in terms of um, uh, uh, getting the, par the parties to understand. Because many of them come, and some of them come to for negotiations based on their own personal experiences. And they are probably right, because in a way they had probably a nasty history. And so it's really hard sometimes to take off that feeling and somebody vents it in the meeting room. So you have to find ways of how to you know, change those dynamics, especially if you have to reach some level of consensus. One of the really interesting features of, of Juba, and again, you, you touched on it briefly in your presentation, was how internationalized the, these peace talks were and, and how heavy the international presence in Juba was. Everything from the UN mediators to international NGOs, uh, journalists, uh, and, and the ICC obviously loomed large over the whole process. D do you fundamentally see international actors as, as a help or a hindrance to, to, to these kind of peace talks? Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, definitely, as you can see around the world, especially now, a number of these peace processes uh, 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 
are being heavily funded. I mean, without international support, most of these peace processes will actually not happen. Uh, they are both positive and sometimes negative roles that end up being, you know, I mean, happening in those processes that impact on those processes <coughs> negatively. Uh, the positive side, of course, is that the money is provided and uh, the meetings are held. Uh, the risk, though, sometimes uh, these negotiations begin taking a life of their own if they are over monetized. But again, on the other hand, the people who provide the funding mostly also have an interest. And sometimes they end up pushing certain interests uh, with uh, very strict timelines that may not take into account the realities of what's happening. And that, of course, poses a challenge. Um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the Juba process, I mean, uh, we had other actors who, of course, provided funding later. But at the same time, uh, they said, well, if they don't sign by this day, then, of course, let's just go for a military solution. You know, If the talks cannot move, then the other alternative, stark alternative, is continue the fighting. So this really poses a serious risk uh, to uh, uh, the, the, the whole uh, negotiations. Then at times, of course, there are all these unrealistic demands that are put, especially around the time frame and timetables. Please, by this time, if this doesn't happen, then these, in a way, kind of um, uh, uh, raises uh, very serious challenges. And you know they could easily disorganize uh, talks. And these are very practical realities. Um, of course, um, different agencies have different interests and so on. Others come with good intentions. Others are also spoilers, also take advantage of the process. You know, everyone wants to sometimes also have some level of recognition uh, or, you know, about what they have done in a process, but sometimes could really undermine the process. So these are practical realities that uh, any mediator or team involved in peace processes should be on the lookout all the time uh, to try and see. Others come and you know, push that whether at all costs, you know, if international justice, if it's not the ICC, then nothing else falls short of that. And uh, of course, these also raise sometimes very serious issues. Uh, uh, there are, no, of course, certain ways you can still push uh, for those processes. And I think in the case of Uganda, I think the pressure from international justice compelled uh, the country to think more deeply of how they can put in place national mechanisms to a large extent that is also in conformity with issues of international justice. You know. I, I, I know we've got a, a few donors um, and, and a few international organization representatives uh, here this evening. Uh, how do international actors make themselves more effective in, in these kinds of peace negotiations? I mean, given the problems that you've raised with, with some of the international influences of Cuba, what, what, what can outside actors do more effectively to, to play a, a more constructive role in these types of talks? Yeah, I think uh, to me, of course, the obvious one is, of course, funding. Uh, 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 which is very helpful. But uh, I think it will also be important that uh, their roles, to a large extent, is more advisory, uh, advisory, uh, without really kind of like uh, uh, pushing too much on certain uh, uh, areas. Of course, they have reasons why they fund certain processes. and. Uh, we have to strike a balance uh, in, 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 in those areas. And of course, doing the advocacy. Uh, because generally, peace processes are very expensive. And uh, if they can rally colleagues and other people to come on board and contribute to the pool, uh, that's uh, very good. And I think, in a way, they try to do it uh, with the Juba peace negotiations, to try and really uh, a rally and uh, get they had to put in a basket fund called the Juba Initiative Fund, which uh, was being funded by a couple of uh, donors, put in a basket to fund the process, which at least helped the process move somewhere, which is 
something that they can also still continue doing. One of the big sticking points in Juba was Uganda's insistence on amnesty, even for very high level suspects of, of human rights violations. And, there, and there's clearly a huge debate today about whether amnesty should still be on the table for senior perpetrators. What, what's your sense there? That looking at Juba, looking at Uganda's experience over the last 15 or 16 years with the Amnesty Act, mm. is it right that international advocates are saying amnesty shouldn't be available for that level of actor and that we should be pushing for prosecutions? Where, 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 do, we, where do you think we should, we should be on the amnesty question? Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe just to also correct an impression. I think Juba was not, it did not specifically say even for high-level perpetrators, they should get am amnesty. But they just proposed that let their amnesty be there. But they also said for prosecutions, let it also be there for those who bear the greatest responsibility. So uh, that was something that was proposed in Juba. Now, the whole debate around amnesty is one that is, of course, uh, quite uh, con controversial in the sense. But of course, uh, given the recent developments, it would be unthinkable to you know, propose an amnesty in the wake of atrocity crimes, especially serious crimes involving war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And so I think certain exceptions uh, need to be made uh, 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 in that area. I think drawing from the experiences of other countries who have uh, proposed amnesty, and of course in Uganda recently, uh, in actually April last year, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that amnesty shouldn't be automatic or blanket for that matter. It should only apply for crimes committed in the course of advancing your political objective, for instance. Uh, but if you go and rape women, kill people, I mean, how, how, how does that advance your political objective? At least if you did acts of economic sabotage or something, one can understand that you can qualify. So I think, in a way, there is also a growing feeling, and I think the consensus in Uganda also that we should have amnesty in exceptional cases, and it shouldn't be applied for atrocity crimes. A couple of final questions, kind of bringing us up to the present. Um, was Juba the last serious chance to negotiate with the LRA? Do you see any prospect for future talks with, with, with the rebels? Um, well, uh, that's an interesting question, but my reading, it looks like Juba cannot be rewound fully in the sense as it was to have fresh negotiations. But if it's about going to sign the final peace agreement, probably that is what could happen, a reading from the developments that have happened so far. And uh, it would be unthinkable to rewind the clock and start fresh negotiations. Although we get certain information, unofficial, that, well, they are still open to revisit, uh, I think the government of Uganda will, never, will not be, you know, willing to go back again into protracted negotiations. Uh, they already had it over two years of negotiation, and uh, uh, it's very unlikely. I also think international community will be also less reluctant, uh, given what has been happening so far. But uh, I think what can only happen is have the olive branch uh, still available for those who are willing to come back home uh, to come back home and abandon rebellion. But if, for instance, the LRA said, well, we want to come and actually sign, then I think that's what can happen, not protracted negotiations. That's my reading. A final question from me before we, we throw it open to everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, coming out of the, the latest elections in Uganda, what, what, what's your sense of Uganda's political trajectory now? H how do you see things playing out over the next five, ten years, given, given Museveni and the NRM's win again? Yes, uh, my take, of course, is that, uh, first of all, these were one of the most intense campaigns that have ever happened in the history of the country. 
uh, the level of excitement, uh, the level of optimism by different groups was very, very high. I'm sure different groups thought their candidates were actually were going to win at all costs. And uh, attempts by uh, the party that lost the leading opposition group, that is the FTC, to even uh, 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 wanting to declare their own results. They even attempted to hold their own parallel swearing in ceremony for their president, whom they call the people's president. And uh, of course, recent, he has been recently incarcerated uh, and charged with the treason. Uh, tells you that there's an increasing level of uh, political, I mean, the political temperature is rising. Um, uh, definitely, it poses questions for any serious government in power uh, to begin thinking deeper into the long term, you know, issues around uh, 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 the whole question of political inclusivity. Uh, issues around dialogue uh, with different groups that are, you know, extremely uh, uh, bitter uh, with uh, the ongoing arrangements. And uh, I think, to me, in the long term, somewhere, somehow, the new government will need to find a fora through which it can engage with those groups. And of course, try to deal also much with the underlying issues that seems to be causing this kind of tension. Uh, of course, you know, we have one of the highest unemployment rates among the youth uh, who can easily get swayed away in all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, political gymnastics that are happening. And uh, there is a need to somehow ease those tensions and create an environment through which even parties that probably did not win feel they are part and parcel of a, an inclusive process. Yeah. Great. Um, so I want to throw it open now to uh, comments and questions from you all. Um, and we've got a couple of microphones here. So I'm wondering if there are a couple of people that can help me pass the microphones around. <laughs> um, I also have to work out how these things work. But there we go. The um, star. Thanks, Thanks. Great. And um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is take sort of a group of maybe three or four questions to begin with. Brilliant. Thank you kindly. Um, yeah, let's start with Caesar here. And if, if you could also just say who you are, what uh, organization uh, you come from, that, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Caesar from Conservation Resources. Yeah, hello. Yeah, Caesar from Conservation Resources. Uh, we, 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 we would like to, to deal with the issue of the ICC. And the question first and then comments. That in your reading, is there any appetite for addressing the actions that UPDF have done in Northern Uganda? Mm -hmm. Or any national kind of program for trauma healing or reconciliation? I say this because the international community, when they investigated uh, the, the crimes in northern Uganda, uh, it was quite surprising that they only indicted the LRA. So uh, in northern Uganda, the perception is that there is international justice playing out with impunity, that, that UPDF are kind of scot-free scot from what they did. And since the, uh, the, the ICC did not indict any single UPDF officer, there must be a recognition by government for trauma healing or reconciliation, recognizing what, what they have actually done. Because there's no mechanism in which the ICC is going to go back and indict in a, the, the UPDF. It is an opportunity now because the government is not under any threat for somebody overthrowing the government. The process of trauma healing and reconciliation is now. I say this because constantly in our work, in northern Uganda in the last so many years, there are atrocities that were meted by UPDF, burying people alive, uh, excavating uh, 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 graves that were already... Uh, these are uh, taboos that have actually been broken. And the surprise is that s 
the, the community that have actually experienced a, a UPDF officer burying people alive in northern Uganda, there's, there's no mechanism for addressing, uh, for addressing this. If a national program of trauma healing or reconciliation is not taken seriously, the only mechanism communities will have to do is to devise a way of dealing with that trauma. And the way in which historically everywhere in around the world is passing it to the next generation. So in Uganda, uh, do we want this idea that somebody who witnessed his, 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 his family being buried alive by a UPDF officer passes it to the next generation because there's no mechanism for, for re recognition of what, what has actually happened. ICC has not indicted these people. The community knows that they've actually done this kind of thing. So, uh, Michael, is there any appetite in Uganda for national reconciliation or trauma healing? Okay, great. Thanks, Susan. Um, question down the, down the front here. And again, if you could introduce yourself. My name is Olawang John Obalim. I am a Ugandan uh, resident in the UK. Um, now, I, uh, recently the government of Uganda has been castigating the ICC a lot, dismissing it, and also invited Bashir to attend um, the is it inauguration of, 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 of the president of Uganda, newly elected. Now, how do you actually reconcile the current position uh, that the government of Uganda has taken against the ICC with the ongoing trial going on at the ICC uh, against Dominic Nguyen? Thank you. Good. And I'll take one more in this round on this side of the room. Yeah, down the front here. There'll be lots of time for everybody else, so you'll get your chance. Thanks. Um, hi, Michael. My name is Sylvie Namwase. I'm a student at the University of East London but I'm also um, from Uganda. My question is concerning land rights in northern Uganda as they are occurring today. Um, in your opinion, to what extent is the PRDP um, taking into consideration the land violence that is happening right now in northern Uganda and the question of uh, investors dispossessing or allegedly dispossessing um, people in northern Uganda of access to their land. Thank you. Great, thanks. Michael, do you want to take those questions and then we'll go for another round? No, no. Uh, thanks. Uh, yes, is a, you raise an important uh, issue, the need for trauma healing. Uh, as you know, the consequences of the conflict has affected so many people who still continue to live with the, you know, sad memories and experiences and the tendency of uh, 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 one uh, kind of, um, as you say, passing it or even meting it on others uh, is quite high. Um, it's true the ICC has only indicted the rebels and not the government forces. And uh, according to them, they claim uh, that so far the evidence that was given to them about UPDF do not meet certain thresholds that they would categorize as war crimes or crimes against humanity for that matter. And they say, well, if others have information, then they can pass it on. And more recently, if you had the statement from the Office of the Prosecutor, uh, she has categorically said she will never open any new investigations in Uganda. Uh, and uh, the only person left that she wants is actually coin, uh, and the rest can come out. So the prospects of opening up ICC investigations on, um, on a UPDF uh, may not happen. Uh, yes, there have been instances and reports, and even the president has acknowledged them uh, publicly. Uh, uh, and of course, he notes that um, there were actually shameful acts committed by members of his uh, security uh, uh, forces. Uh, but he has often fell, fallen short of calling for a full inquiry into some of those issues. And uh, we wish he could follow through. Uh, of course, we were optimistic that once the government puts in place a comprehensive transitional justice policy, then it would have helped create that framework through which to respond. But right now, as I told you, that in the absence of an approved policy, 
government cannot even commit resources uh, to even respond. So everything is just still hanging or in abeyance for the moment, uh, which is quite disturbing. And I think, of course, uh, uh, maybe we can call on actors like yourself to also continue the advocacy to try and compel the government to put in place the transitional justice policy, which in my view would provide a number of uh, you know, uh, things that could be you know, implemented with the exi existing framework and other initiatives so that the risk of having another cycle of violence is actually avoided. And this is something that needs to be, to, to be done. Uh, Mr. Obalim, yes, um, what you raise is seen as double standards, definitely. Uh, but as you know, um, Museveni is following a decision uh, that I think as heads of state and AU countries, as you know what their position has been, uh, uh, talking about uh, non-collaboration with the ICC, even their talks around withdrawal and mass, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is all about immunity of heads of states. Uh, they think the ICC is being disrespectful to them as presidents, uh, but they can go for smaller fish, you know. <laughs> and that's why you, for, for, for them, Ongwen can easily be disposed. Uh, but for sitting heads of states, they want to protect themselves. So that's, in a way, the context. And I think, following the indictment of Bashir, but I think the worst, uh, I mean, what even sparked it further was the Kenyan cases, uh, the indictment of Uhuru Kenyatta and his deputy and the other uh, uh, two other people. And so it kind of intensified uh, the discussion among the different heads of states of how they can engage with the ICC. So uh, yes, uh, they are playing some level of double standards uh, in this whole thing. And of course, it's uh, a political issue that um, as you say, we can discuss until the cows come home. I don't have a <laughs> final answer on that. Uh, Sylvia, the whole question of land, uh, definitely land issues pose uh, a challenge uh, in northern Uganda. I'm happy I'm seeing a professor here who has done extensive work on that question uh, in the north, but uh, it's quite kind of complicated because at different levels, with different actors, and with different interests. And uh, of course, the result and consequences of either even led to loss of life, destruction of property, and the tensions continue, including displacement of people. And uh, 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 to what extent government has addressed that within the PRDP framework is that um, when you look at the pillars of the PRDP, there are about four or so pillars. Uh, the focus is on consolidating state security, improving livelihoods, peace reconciliation, and I think infrastructure, something like that. But if you see how much is allocated, where of course interventions in helping peace building, it has a very small component. Uh, <laughs> the budget allocation is very small, and I think uh, 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 in terms of that, I don't think they are doing really much. In the past, they would give it to either the Amnesty Commission or the, uh, you know, to do reintegration, but not specifically uh, helping. And of course, the districts continue to grapple with the whole question of land issues. They continue to emerge every day, uh, but they are constrained resource-wise. Uh, that continue to, to pose a challenge. Let's take another round of questions. Um, there's Louis here, so just down that aisle. Yeah, yeah hi. I'm Louis Brooks. I'm a former student here. Um, you talked a lot about some of the mechanisms you use to um, consult with the community and then to um, decrease tension between different parties at the Juba Talks. Um, I was just wondering, sort of, how those sort of mechanisms are decided upon and whether um, sort of the experiences of other countries or other conflicts um, in Uganda's history, for example, or, or in other countries, whether those kind of experiences come into your mind as people are making those sort of decisions and whether those experiences are learned from or whether it's much more of a, as, as the different actors around you, you collectively decide this is the best way forward. Okay. 
Good. Um, there's a gentleman here who can probably pass the mic straight. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Grey Suit. I'm African African of actually origin. Um, <coughs> I'm very, very, very critical of the international community's role in Uganda. In almost all the cases where there have been conflicts, whether it is um, um, Middle East, Sri Lanka, or in other places, there have actually been interna effective international representation where there is a, a, an actual UN envoy. And that is normally the sort of person who is mediating between the two parties. There was kind of tokenism shown when Chizano was uh, temporarily uh, drafted. And he definitely was in, a, uh, in bed with Museveni because of the historical factors. There should have been some kind of an arbiter who would have been able to balance on both sides, showing a kind of impartiality. That should have been followed up with a proper infrastructure of a UN envoy office stationed <coughs> preferably in Gulu. How come that none of that has actually happened? Now all the reconstructive programs that have actually taken place in Uganda under the auspices of the Office of the Prime Minister have been riddled with corruption. That's so much money that has actually been pumped by the international community have been proven to be ineffective. We are talking about land issues and some of the other civil matters, reconciliation, I do believe very strongly that an effective internationally operated office which would be situated in the local area would have a much more, much more clout, accountability and responsibility to actually make sure that whatever little money that's actually sent is well spent and for the purpose that it actually suits it. At the same time, the same international communities are the ones who are running around in suitcases trying to sell arms. Britain and the USA are one of the biggest arms dealers. And they are the very people who are actually supplying these innocent people or non-innocent people in the countries. Now, what are the donors actually doing to make sure that these well-established organizations or governments are accountable for some of the excesses in making sure that uh, there is a proliferation of arms into these um, so-called banana republics who cannot account for some of the armaments? This, I believe, is the role that the international community has remained silent. And then, of course, on the issue of the ICC, they have taken a very selective role. Uganda, on record, has been uh, found guilty for the what uh, 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 for the damage uh, of war crimes that they committed in Congo, and surely Uganda should have been brought to account for its own problems in its own backyard. How come that has actually not taken place? And yet we are allowing Uganda to have its sovereignty and enjoy all the privileges that any other sovereign country what um, uh, exhibits. That to me is completely untenable, and I think it's a charade. If I told you donors are actually here, I really want you to account and be responsible for this. Thank you. Okay, one more question in this round. We'll, we'll have time for, for another one. Um, Mark, here. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Mark Kirsten from um, the University of Toronto. I have kind of a question and a half. The first is, um, what is the LRA now, right? Because when we read reports, it's a spent force. It's just, um, you know, it's just trying to survive. Now it's, now it's in the ivory trade. Um, yet it gets an incredible amount of attention. If a hundred U.S. soldiers are in northern Uganda stationed with them, some estimates of the strength of the uh, uh, of the LRA would make it a one-to-one -one ratio of U.S. soldiers to LRA combatants. So is it a spent force? Is it not a spent force? And what, what is it that explains this incredible amount of NGO reports, U.S. military attention, and even public events that this, this force gets if it is a spent force and is so small? And the second is actually I want to follow up on this question on, on Dominic Nguyen. And on the one hand, yes, it's, it's a double standard. And Museveni says, you know, the ICC is race hunting. He invites Bashir. Um, but on the other hand, th what I want to push you on is actually not... Um, 
is is not the re not his reaction against the ICC, but why he actually gave the ICC in a sense a present by giving them on Gwen something that provides credibility to the ICC for finally getting somebody in their custody, rather than as you mentioned prosecuting him like they've done with Coelho in the International Crimes Division, showing here's the rule of law, here's our transitional justice in action, and so on and so forth. Why not prosecute Dominic on Gwen? domestically in the International Crimes Division and instead give the ICC a win when, in fact, publicly you're saying it's race hunting. And now, in fact, Uganda has to commit to cooperating with the court over investigating additional crimes that Ogoen's committed. Thanks. Uh, Marco. Yeah, uh, I'll start with uh, Sama. Uh, the methods uh, that are used to, to reach out to communities, get their voices, and so on, uh, there are different ways uh, through which information is sought uh, from communities, either through NGO documentation projects, either through holding community dialogues, either using other traditional ways, organizing wang o's, which is like sitting around a fireplace and people uh, can provide information. And of course that information is passed on, and of course they're held for a purpose and passed on to the right people, and that's how for instance, uh, you find that we communicate the views of the people to different actors who we think need to know about specific things. Uh, Agre, yes, th you have given some some are really proposals, and uh, which I think uh, uh, can uh, uh, make some plausible, um, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, kind of. Um, positions. Uh, to the extent of Chisano's role uh, being biased in favor of Museveni, uh, well he was appointed by the UN uh, to come as a UN you know, envoy uh, to the process, to support the process. I'm sure he's one of the few African leaders who have seen, I mean people who they thought had the credibility and the legitimacy. Uh, depending on the different biases, but he was able to play his role until at a point when he couldn't. But also the AU also had an envoy uh, to the process as well. Ambassador um, Francisco Madeira, I think now he's with the, uh, with the AU. Uh, and, and a number of people uh, which in a way would backstop, including a number of African countries' representatives who I thought were fairly neutral and also supporting as observers really to the process. So it wasn't that one person would wholly, and I think, you know, wholly decide on the direction of things. It had to be a consultative process. Uh, yes, funds by international community and so on. Yes, uh, I'm sure the international community invested quite a bit and they continue to invest. But as you know, um, uh, positions shift with the time. Uh, 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 with the time, as the LRA conflict gets off the international radar, I think these days people want to look at countries like Syria and other hot spots. Uh, uh, you know, and, and this also really poses a challenge. And uh, some of because when you look at what these conflicts do, they have long-term <coughs> devastating consequences. And once you intervene and you just pull away just like that, sometimes there are gaps. And of course, uh, Uganda government itself may not have put enough resources to make sure that they deal uh, with some of these issues. Uh, well, on the question of arms and so on, well, I'm not privy to <laughs> what who is doing what. Uh, but uh, definitely, if some of those things happen, uh, they, they can really pose uh, 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 challenges, uh, you know, uh, and of course uh, escalate, uh, for instance, various conflicts where they are happening. Uh, the ICC taking on a selective role and so on, I think it is the ICG, the International Court of Justice, not the ICC, uh, that made a decision on the whole question of uh, Uganda versus uh, DRC. And uh, on making that decision, they give an opportunity for the countries to negotiate and come. I think there have been attempts to do that negotiation uh, between the government of Uganda and DRC. Um, of course, the challenges are 
well, it's government in Uganda, but of course, uh, it's the whole question of uh, those individuals and others involved in the whole process. Uh, that, to me, raises serious concern, uh, other than getting the whole country, uh, you know, uh, involved. But um, uh, that's not uh, withstanding, I think. Um, uh, we wait for the final decision. I'm sure that uh, I we followed some time the discussions were still fraught with challenges and lack of agreement on certain areas, but I think they are still uh, negotiating and hopefully the court will advise what will be the way forward. Uh, but this is a matter to be resolved uh, between uh, the countries. Uh, Mark, on the issue of LRS strength, I really don't have an answer immediate answer, how many they are. <laughs> uh, I, I last engaged, or in other words, of course I've been following the developments, the reports by other groups that actually monitor the LRA situation, Resolve, and, uh, you know, Invisible Children, CR, and who, the conciliation resources who engage in those regions may have more updated information, but definitely fewer they are, I think they are still a vicious group. Uh, 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 shown by the impact of their actions uh, in uh, those uh, communities. And so if they can really impact and continue to displace thousands and thousands of people, then I think uh, it's not really completely a spent force. And uh, that's why maybe uh, 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 there are 100 US adv soldiers who are advising the regional task force are still there. and. Was it not too long ago I hear that mandate was extended mm -hmm. for another year? So I'm sure they believe, you know, that uh, this group is still a lethal one and uh, can be uh, quite dangerous if not contained. On Dominic Ongwen, uh, why Museveni gave uh, him and uh, not, uh, you know, uh, Quo Yellow, um, I think was more from a practical consideration. Uh, I don't think um, Uganda government right now, they could try, but uh, the circumstances, I don't think we'll have the resources to actually uh, conduct a trial of that magnitude. Uh, 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 it would raise uh, quite serious uh, challenges, and hopefully so they felt maybe the best is to actually have the ICC uh, deal with that. Uh, prosecuting Quo Yellow at the ICD, yes, and uh, it still faces serious challenges, of course. Uh, uh, the court is still grappling with uh, uh, financial issues as well uh, to be able, because, I mean, when you try these crimes of an international nature, uh, they also come under a lot of international scrutiny. Uh, there are certain standards they are different from trying ordinary crimes and uh, you know the standards are quite high and so they really require resources to be able to do that the personnel are there uh, but um, you know you ha must have a very elaborate witness protection for instance program you uh, and a number of other things uh, logistically quite challenging uh, but I think uh, Uganda is still keen to prove a case that uh, since they enacted the ICC Act, put in place a war crimes court, uh, they will also want to prove that they are able to, you know, uh, 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 you know, try these uh, crimes uh, domestically. So I think it wasn't necessarily a win, but from a very practical consideration that we would not be able to do it effectively. What I'll do now is take one, one final group of questions. I still see lots and lots of hands. So I'm actually going to try and give everybody a very, very brief say, Michael, that you then don't feel any need to respond to absolutely everybody, but you can kind of pick the ones that you think are most interesting and, and, and respond to those. So we'll, we'll give everybody their, uh, their, their show. There's a, a lady at the back there, yes, who, who's, you've had your hand up for a while, sorry. And again, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Margaret. Um, from Ugandan community. Um, I just want to ask Michael, uh, you sound so confident that there will be never, ever 
uh, peace talk with LRA. Um, have you learned from them past experience from other countries? Who would have thought that um, the, um, the negotiation between Palestina, Colombians, those armed groups would take place? If you, why why um, you cannot go back to peace negotiation with LRA? Why is it different when other countries have done it? Who would have thought that um, Mandela would be on the table for a peace talk and he became a, a, a president later on? There's a, there's a kind of a string of three people in a row here, which is geographically very convenient for the microphone. So we'll take the three of you in a, in a cluster here. Yeah, uh, thank you. My name is Josefina Pera. I'm an organization called Uganda Concern Network. I'm also a political and human rights activist. I happen to be in Juba for the peace talk, having lobbied international community and foreign government that the, the conflict in Uganda should be uh, ended through dialogue. And that brought about some changes in policies from outside. So it did not only work from the ground, we also acted from outside here. Now, when I was in Juba, we were surprised to find that the movement that took people to Juba was to arrest the LRS. It was not about peace talk. That's why they were talking about, um, we need it very quick. You know, we need to get this poll very quickly. Get them into the you know, in the center so that we can catch the, the leaders. That was all it was all about. So even if you are going for a peace talk, how can you not be suspicious? How can you not you know, distrust the people? How can you not, you know, worry about what's going to happen? So it was not about peace talk. It's not addressing, it's not about addressing what went wrong. In the first place, why did the war start? Why did the war start? Huh? What is the root cause of the war? These people just jump up one day in the bush and started killing each other. No. Mr. Tim, you come from Acholi. Since when, as you grew up, when did a Acholi man or a woman decide to take a child away to go and abuse or do anything to the child? When? When did it start? We need to ask ourselves why and when it started. Somebody brought it into a Acholi area. And we need to be honest about that if we want peace talk to come to a Acholi area. That's number one. Number two, the agenda. Nobody was going to discuss anything to do with agenda at all. I was there, we had to push with some other international community so that we came up with an agenda to be discussed because the government said that there is no agenda to discuss with the LRA. We said, how can it be? Why were you fighting each other? And we were asking, the, oh, the government has got a constitution which says that it should protect the citizen and their property. Why did it not do it? Why did the international community or the your community, the NGO community, why did they not bring the government to account? Why did they not protect the population and their property? And nobody can answer that. Number three, the delegations. OK, I'm going to finish soon. The delegation that went to Juba, the LRA was not allowed to select or nominate their delegation. Most of the people who flocked to Juba were mainly government agents. And they were acting on both sides. And then they would come and pretend to be talking for the LRA. They end up in a government hotel, eating the money, celebrating, and doing all sorts of rubbish. They were not caring about the population who were in the camp. This is something that, when you talk about the peace talk not succeeding, this is what is not, why nothing was touched about the peace talk. The population in this camp were waiting to hear when our issue are going to be discussed. So the agendas were not discussed except cessation of utility. The rest of the agenda was not discussed because the people and the leaders, people like Masanga, who went there were agents of government and they were not discussing on behalf of the population. That's why the agenda and the, uh, whatever they signed was completely rubbish. It was something of their own interest, nothing to do with the, what went wrong with the government. Because our intention, the intention of people who went there was to come up with a commission, after discussion, to come up with a commission. We would go through the root cause of the war, the comprehensive solution, and disarmament, and all the rest of it. That will allow people to go back. Why do you think the people did not go to the uh, to assembly point? Because those programs were not there. All they wanted was to arrest their leaders and take them away. So how can you blame them for not coming there? Okay. Anyway, I'm not going to be long. OK, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I think we. Yeah. I asked for brief comments. And okay, we, okay. And you yeah. had quite a lengthy one there. So, <laughs> yeah, Richie. Hi, I'm Richie. I'm a former student and worked on the um, Learning from Leaders Research Project. Um, my sense from the questions in the room is that 
there's a lot of questions about the ICC at quite a senior level, and then questions about things like land rights and trauma and reconciliation at a more local level, which makes me wonder about the role of middle tier leaders now, where there are no specific negotiations going on, going on. You've mentioned sort of um, community coalitions established at locals and national levels. So what's what's the role for the middle tier leaders right now in addressing the concerns which are definitely happening at a local level and at a more senior sort of international level? Noga. Thank you. Um, Noga Glucks, I'm a PhD student here at SOAS. Um, I want to ask you about transition. Um, in peace building, in peace, we talk about transition, but especially also in transitional justice. Transition is a key element, and yet, uh, at least according to my own analysis, uh, there is no transition in Uganda. And I'm not just talking about northern Uganda, I'm talking about Uganda in general. Um, there is a problem of multiple conflicts overlapping, and I think this was raised here today as well. Neither of those is really transitioning, but rather being swept under the rug in favor of something that makes sense at a time to someone in power. So, and again, this is kind of my analysis. If you disagree, I'd be keen to hear why. And if you do, I would like to hear your kind of reflection. What is really possible in terms of real peaceful transition, real transitional justice in Uganda in the absence of any real political transition. Thank you. Good, thanks. Yep, question. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bosco Nyeko from Uganda, and um, I'm a pro-democracy activist as well. Um, obviously, with the events unraveling in Uganda, a lot at hand at the moment. Um, having heard everything that had to be said this evening, it is quite clear that whatever situation is in Uganda, or in northern Uganda in particular, all we have is a tentative peace. The guns may have fallen silent, but everything, all the problems have literally not been dealt with. And it's so unfortunate that even the money that was given to re rehabilitate Uganda, some people, dis the government of Uganda, decided to divert the funds into their private bank accounts, something that we raised with the British government here. They were obviously very concerned. All the European Union literally decided to withdraw those funds from, well, at least they asked Ugandans, to, Ugandan government to pay that money back. So my question really um, is, I, I, I don't really see how Uganda can be a viable state if Museveni is left in power. So part, part of the solution to the problem may require actually a regime change in Uganda, <laughs> because not only was two million people kept in camps in northern Uganda. Now the whole country is at gunpoint with nothing anybody can do in Uganda. So I, I don't know if maybe our, our presenters this evening can literally elaborate on those kind of very serious issues because the country is fragmenting at a very fast rate. And also on the issue of ICC, it's quite clear that if you have powerful patrons outside, you become the untouchable. That is what clearly Museveni has gone away with absolute destruction of the country for the last 30 years, despite the rhetoric that Uganda is improved and so forth. And I think one of the key areas is that the patron seems to be very concerned with security or personal interest, very trivial things within Africa. And it's creating a whole bulwark of problems right in East and Central Africa, going all the way to the Horn of Africa. Only two days ago, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, which Uganda obviously has done so much to help Western government, especially with sec their security concern, happened to have Amazon, which is with a huge contribution from Uganda. And what has happened now, Amazon obviously has become a war economy. Ugandan soldiers have been caught selling weapons to Al-Shabaab. So it is a vested interest. So if you want to cling onto power, just invest in Somalia. It doesn't matter what you do to your own population. The world will just turn a blind eye. Unfortunately, Ugandans will pay a heavy price for this, and I do fear that after Museveni, the country may disintegrate. Thank you very much. Well, let me come to this, this side of the room. Yep, uh, two in a row there. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt Kandel. I'm a postdoc at SOAS. Um, I was wondering if you could say a uh, a bit about the relationship uh, between Khartoum and LRA, and then uh, Uganda and SPLA, and then um, how perhaps uh, the LRA and uh, was was caught up or was uh, in a broader interstate conflict or uh, rivalry there 
and how perhaps the, that shifted the trajectory of the conflict, and then perhaps whether too often the uh, analyses of, of conflicts um, in Africa coming from, the, from Western countries tends to um, focus or argue that they're broadly intrastate, they're within countries, and there's not the same interstate components that perhaps we've seen in other parts of the world, and how even with, say, non-insurgencies, so for instance, cattle raiding, how maybe these conflicts are also um, maybe caught up in uh, other interstate issues, or at least between the, the leaders of, of other countries, say in, say in East Africa, for instance. Hi, uh, Cara Blackmore, London School of Economics. Um, given ICTJ's current debate around should we remember and should we forget, I wonder if maybe you could speak about what that means in the context of Uganda um, and, and how we might move forward on either side of that coin. And then uh, perhaps you could uh, speak to the critique coming from places like Luero and Bundibujo and Kasese about this idea that we have national policies and national efforts when in fact they're driven by northern predominantly Acholi thinking and, and efforts that might create more divisiveness than unity that they intend to promote. There was a question here too. You've had a lot of um, comments and questions, Michael. <laughs> I don't. I, it's a big pile of complexity. I just wanted to Could add you and say. To well, I'm Andy Carl. I'm a, a former colleague of uh, Caesar's here with Conciliation Resources, or formerly with Conciliation Resources. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I, I wanted to just. Well, my comment is really just to kind of thank you for the presentation you've done. It reminds me of the. I, I really appreciate how kind of considered you are, uh, how careful you are in what you, in the way you tell your tell the story, and how important it is to remember. Um, what happened, um, and and I and I'm, I, I really value that we shouldn't forget this 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 part of history, and I feel really I really appreciate this moment in this room that you you've you've given us uh, this real living history, which I think some some of it things you've said still aren't recorded and risk being forgotten, um, and I'm also very struck by the of course the. You, you've lived this experience, and, and, and your project feels very interesting projects, and someone has already asked a kind of question like this. I think that obviously it's a very unique and very complex context, but I do see uh, similarities to other conflicts in the world where you also, we don't see conflicts ending through a peace agreement. Mm -hmm. We don't see victors and vanquished. And we see the, the roles of people like yourselves and organizations like the NGO Forum or the Acholi Religious Leaders or all the, the many people who show, have shown leadership in civil society um, need to show this leadership of how do you how do you deal with this unfinished business, um, and how do you how do you how do you continue to win and wage the peace uh, when when it's not being won at the uh, in the battlefield or at the negotiation table, mm -hmm. and any you you've mentioned some extraordinary achievements you've had after Juba, um, mm -hmm. in terms of some of the agendas you've moved forward. But I'd be interested, just one more thing, it's just you know what <laughs> you're really what you're what you're proud of really of, of, that you've been working on of late where you've. Where you really you you and the collective you really where you really advanced that agenda of working on the unfinished business. Great, mm. Rod. Thank you. Okay, Michael. There's there's oh. more more than enough there. This, I, I, I would has, strongly say has. pick and choose. Don't try and <laughs> respond to everything because I feel like it would be a, a lecture of its own. But maybe yes. ma maybe two or three of the, the the main points that you see there and, and respond to that. And the, and the rest, I'm sure you can engage with, um, yeah, with people with afterwards. Yeah, thanks uh, Phil and uh, of course thanking also uh, members of the room for raising some of these um, uh, 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 important questions. Um, Margaret, I agree, you know, uh, with your viewpoint, but uh, we just look at things from a very practical reality and as you said, and uh, just linking it to what Andy just said, you know, sometimes it's hard for negotiations to be resumed in very many contexts for different things and could be concluded in different ways. Um, I do not completely sound that I'm too confident, uh, well, depending on how you judge <laughs> the reading, but looking at a very, it would be quite challenging to, from a very realistic point of view, to reopen. And that links up with what Josephine also raised. Uh, she was part of the delegation, and I'm happy to have met Josephine again after a while. And um, well, she has her own views about what she sees 
how the process really went, uh, 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 whether there was, of course, naturally there could be a level of dissatisfaction in how certain processes went because of other complicating factors, which you might know better than I do. Uh, I wouldn't want to go to them. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we look at the more broader uh, 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 process that at least they had five major agenda items that were concluded and in initialed, and that was forming the backbone of the support and current TJ developments that are happening in Uganda. Whether it's a good or bad thing is an issue of debate, really. Uh, I missed some two names. Um, uh, uh, but uh, there was uh, all this question around the role of uh, what middle-level actors uh, are doing or what can they do in the current situation. I think there's quite a bit that uh, middle-level you know, uh, uh, actors need to continue uh, doing the, you know, bridging the gap, getting the information. Uh, after all, a number of them are experienced, technical, knowledgeable on a number of things, and can help uh, you know propel the implementation of some of these initiatives uh, 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 you know uh, over time. So uh, I think they still continue to play quite vital role uh, and uh, would continue to do so. The whole question around transition, yes, uh, there is no major transition. Uh, in the country, uh, well, there have been some transitions. I mean, there is a move from peace. There was conflict. There is peace. There are others, of course. Political transition could be an issue, and other transition. But that doesn't mean, uh, and of course, there are different conflicts. Of course, other conflicts still continue to happen at different levels, and you can't do away. In society, there will be conflict all the time, at whatever level. Uh, but uh, in the lens of TJ, uh, I think uh, definitely many successful transitions. Oh, I wouldn't even say very successful, really. Even in countries that have experienced major political transitions have not really made tremendous uh, uh, progress. Even, I mean, there are still concerns even with South Africa, which is always touted as one of the best models uh, of transitional justice still are fraught with challenges with their own uh, you know, processes. So it's not really that once a major regime change or whatever that links with what somebody asked happens, that's when you can have that. Uh, we shouldn't get into that kind of debate. But all we need is to create the conditions and support those initiatives that will respond in a very meaningful way to the, what the victims want. And of course, it's not a quick fix. It could, you know can be precariously long, neither short. So this is something that we continue looking at. Um, Mark, this is a very long question around the relationship LRA Khartoum. Of course, it's a very long <laughs> debate uh, uh, that I'm, I'm sure we can have a private conversation on that. Uh, but it's been, of course, uh, quite complicated. But what I can say, it looks like there's improved relationship between Kampala and Khartoum now. Uh, Bashir was recently in Kampala. Museveni was in Khartoum. So it means the relations between the countries are improving. And uh, a number of developments happening. Uh, but definitely in the past, the LR was a complicating factor. But I think uh, they might have agreed in a way uh, also with the SPLA. So uh, I don't think that, well, they could still be having their own other differences. But at least for now, since the CPA, I think there has been a, a shift in the approach between how Khartoum would look at SPLA or LRA, for that matter, or how Uganda or Kampala would look at maybe Khartoum or, or SPLA. Mm. I do agree when that uh, what formed the current initiative on transitional <laughs> justice in Uganda was largely informed by, by the events and experiences of northern Uganda. But if you look at the consultations with, on transitional justice now, they are 
broader than just only focusing on the north. Uh, I think there are consultations happening even in the hotspot, the western region, except with the new developments. Uh, these are now new emerging conflicts that we are seeing after you know, the elections uh, that we are seeing new conflicts emerging. But previously, from what I know, is that there have been nationwide and uh, consultations. And it was kind of agreed that, of course, if it was largely informed only by the experiences of northern Uganda, it could complicate the process and how people perceive it. Uh, but of course, the challenge, of course, that poses is that given the fact that it's largely driven by the northern Uganda situation, there is a tendency who people think, well, transitional justice, ah, for us, we even don't know what it's for those people of the north, you know, <laughs> uh, because, you know, so there's that. And then they are reminded just because of the lack of motivation. They have, of course, had conflicts in the past, but eventually when they are probed and engaged, then, they, oh, yeah, you know, we also pass through this. And I think, yeah, uh, finally, maybe, and, uh, <laughs> Yes, it's also another long one, but <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, based on the different experiences, different countries offer different contexts, and uh, it's very, very crucial uh, that actors continue, especially like right now in Uganda. Uh, we have had very limited, uh, you know, there was a lot of hype around when the peace talks were concluded, everyone thought the agreements would be quickly implemented, and uh, the victims thought uh, their demands for justice would be addressed. Uh, they would receive reparations. They would, you know, do all this. But now it's eight years down the road. They have not <laughs> seen any of this, and that is rather frustrating. Uh, and in the absence of these official responses, I think the role of specific groups continues to be very, very essential to provide the needed support like what um, um, uh, Caesar raised around the trauma, psychosocial support, addressing other physical needs, uh, you know, engaging communities to talk to each other, given the, you know, uh, the devastating impact the conflict has had on them, and so on, and all these still continue. And I agree that not everything gets finished uh, through the, 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 the peace. It, it could be one step. Uh, it may involve also other subsequent initiatives to completely try and bridge the gap and uh, get people uh, back in shape again. Thank you. Great. Um, I know there are still some other questions, but, but I think yes, we're, we're if it's brief, 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 brief. Okay. okay. <laughs> if you promise me it'll be brief. No, it will be quite, quite brief. <laughs> my, my name is Richard Kuhn. We're going to need your diplomatic hmm? skills here. Mike. Richard Kuhn. Hmm. And uh, I've been involved in this issue of the war in northern Uganda right from day one. And I'm one of the living testimony. And I've been in uh, southern Sudan. I just wanted to highlight some points that I've read all the documentations, history, news cuttings, and not whatever that appears on this war, which some of them I'm going to tell you now, and you will know you never had it. The war in northern Uganda was designed, not by the government of Uganda, but by Museveni. It was to deal with the land issue, money, and destruction. From March, end of March 1983 to June, Museveni collected 21,000 guns from Gulu area. And with that, he made sure there was no more guns. And after that, he changed the calm commanders that were in Kitgum and Gulu and brought the wild commanders, what I call wild commanders. That's triggered the refuge of over 4,000 youth to, the, to, the, to southern Sudan, which most people don't talk of this. And another part, 
before that trigger of the youth taking refuge in southern Sudan, Museveni had linked with SPLA and he supplied them with new guns. We were at Magui, which is 32 miles or 50 uh, kilometers away from, from, uh, from the border of Su uh, Sudan. They made sure they dismantled the 17 refugee camps which belonged to <coughs> the Amin's refugees, plus the new refugee camps that were created for our state in 1986. Okay, please summarize. Yeah. All that was dismantled. And then he started his uh, uh, war issue. What is, is interesting is there are people like Catherine uh, Bourne, uh, Pike, Alison, Richard Daldin, who now differs from Museveni, according to his book, are all hidden. Because the lies of what Museveni told the world of what happened in Luero is now being told by people like uh, Dr. Besije and others who are now against Museveni. Now they talk of half a million Ugandan killed. I wonder whether ICC will close, close their eyes and not even think of those Luero, Luero, Luero people. And why did I say it? it was land, it was money, and so forth. The area in Luero Triangle where these people were killed are now being distributed to investors. Of late, the Turkey president was there. He was given 18 square miles in Luero, in Luero area. And then there are more of the, these Luero destitute in Kampala. They call them Kafesi. What is happening? So there are a lot of these facts that lies behind Museveni, okay. which those who are interested in should learn. Of later, we have been demonstrating, and I highlighted that, the blood trail of Museveni, which he briefly mentioned. You remember in 1965, when the war in, uh, in Mozambique was happening, that is when the Portuguese were being beheaded and pegged on the roadside. And only when the black men were also pegged on the, the, the beheaded and pegged on the, the roadside, did the Cisano we are talking about reacted against that. Okay. And Severi was there. Coin was not there. When he came back in 79, he killed the 500 people in Barara. Coin was not there. The half a million people he killed in, 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 in Luero, if you take away the 40,000 40, he was claiming about to kill, he would still have 460 dead Ugandans. Okay, thanks Richard. Yep, Michael. Uh, just Go to Northern Uganda, 1.2 million. Go to Rwanda. Yeah. I have more about Rwanda. They talk of two issues, the third issue where people were floating in Lake Victoria. It's not discussed. It's not even talked about. They only want people killed when they were running in the gardens and those killed while they were in churches or in the houses. But those who were floating per hour, a hundred per hour in Lake Victoria for two, three months is not to be talked about. Go and mention it in Rwanda. They okay. will chase you now. Richard, you've made your point. Thank you. Michael, a final word. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Richard. Uh, you raised a lot of, well, I'm not so privy to some of these things, but it's good that they are documented and they are known. And uh, of course, uh, that's why in part, uh, the country is grappling with this whole TJ issue you know, to try and look at uh, 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 um, uh, uh, the violations that have happened. Actually, as we talk, there's a, a human rights documentation project uh, which is going to be spearheaded by the Uganda Human Rights Commission to do document conflicts, unfortunately, from 1986 uh, to 2006. Uh, to look at all violations that happen in Uganda uh, during that period. Uh, they have started their work already. Uh, it is hoped that uh, they will produce a different narrative uh, about what exactly happened, uh, which could be an opportunity 
and uh, I think so far they have been they are widely seen to some extent as quite independent, uh, producing critical reports about what's happening, and they'll do a countrywide uh, documentation exercise. Actually, they've started with the Chile sub-region uh, as we talk, and uh, they'll roll out to other parts of uh, the North, uh, West Nile, they'll look at Teso, Lango, and, and move on to the rest of the country, including the West. And hopefully, we think that is going to be a process that will produce an impartial process and uh, ideally it's supposed to contribute to the Uganda's DJ's process but above all looking at the truth-telling process. So we are hopeful and uh, they're not just going to wait until the end. I think they'll be doing it and I think within they, 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 they are seeing it themselves within six months they should have finished the region and released a report which will be a public document. And ideally in part because they want it as an official record. I know for a long time different groups have done documentation uh, in Uganda, mostly NGOs and so on. These reports have been rubbish, but hopefully this time that uh, it's being done by an official state institution, uh, hopefully the state will not run away from the findings of those things. And to me, I think it can provide a good basis to pick up <coughs> on uh, the other cases that you talked about, Buchoro, where people are buried alive, are all going to be looked into. And many, many other areas where serious violations happen. And I think this could form a, a basis to begin a really genuine conversation and dialogue about the future of the, of the state. So uh, it's one thing that we hope and pray that will not uh, be, you know, and should be able to do uh, quite uh, some good work. Uh, they, so far, they have been a respectable institution and also been very critical, actually, of the state. And indeed, they report to the parliament. So we hope that they will do something that gives us a good foundation. That's all I can do to say. Great. Um, just a, a couple of final comments. Um, I'm going to steal Andy's idea of, of living history because I think that that incorporate, encapsulates very nicely what we've been trying to do in, in, in this whole uh, Learning from Leaders project is is to talk about current as well as historical peace negotiations. And peace negotiations as very dynamic processes um, that often have repercussions way outside of those talks themselves. Uh, and I think the case of the Juba talks uh, between the LRA and the Ugandan government is a very good example of, again, talks that are sometimes framed as failed talks because the, the final part of the agreement um, was not signed. But, but we can see how much it still resonates, particularly in Uganda today. Um, and I think we're, as Michael's spoken about, the talks continue to structure community level, but also civil society demands um, and various demands, particularly transitional justice demands in Uganda. But interestingly, Juba also, I think, resonates in the way that the government is still having to talk about the past, whether it likes it or not. Uh, and it's amazing how much Juba continues to be a touchstone for things like the national transitional justice uh, strategy, as stalled as it might be at the moment. Um, the government having to answer really tough questions about reparations, uh, that is forcing the government to have to go back and talk about things that were raised in Juba. So this process from eight years ago, I think, continues to, to resonate in very important ways. Um, and of course, middle tier leaders, as we've heard uh, very clearly from Michael, play an absolutely key role in bridging di different levels of society during those talks and in the way that they continue to reverberate afterwards. Um, just a quick plug for the final event in this series, which will take place uh, probably in October or November. That's going to look at, at Northern Ireland. Um, a couple of quick thank yous. Um, I have two Richards that I need to thank. Um, Richie, who I know he said before he's finished on this project, but that's kind of not really true. Um, Richie's been absolutely central in helping to conceptualize and kind of frame the, the, the whole discussion here. So this event certainly couldn't have taken place uh, without Richie Howarth's help. Um, and also Richard at the back on, on the camera, um, who's working way overtime tonight on a, on a very muggy Thursday evening. Uh, Richard, for the, the AV work um, and the YouTube that will be produced next week, we're, we're very grateful uh, to you as well. Um, you talked, Michael, about the importance of international funders for peace negotiations. It's all, they're also very important for research. So it's vital that I mention the Fetzer Institute, um, who's, who's funding this entire project. And of course, my own department, the politics department here at SOAS. Thank you to them for their support. Um, nothing else remains to be said except to thank all of you for coming out on a very muggy Thursday evening in London. And most importantly, to thank uh, Michael Ottim for uh, really, I think, incisive, um, well-considered 
uh, contributions this evening, for being here this morning uh, to be subjected to my interview and to be here to share with all of us this evening. Michael, we're, we're again, extremely grateful for, for your contributions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.